Welcome to r slash pro revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with pro revenge after being wronged. I hope you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss the new daily videos. The first story is, Contractor abandons project midway, resulting in damages, tries to go off the grid, but I found him and now he's paying me every penny. So the story begins with my needing to hire a contractor to repair damage to a pole barn that I was constructing on our property. The structure was partially done when a storm hit and the structure had substantial damage. So we bid a few contractors and the guy that seemed to be the best one, who was actually a referral from a friend. We signed a contract and he started work within a week. We had also signed with him to complete the structure after the insurance portion was completed because his crew could do this much more efficiently and a better job than we could do ourselves, which is what we were originally doing. His crew completes the insurance portion of the job but then abandons the project just before starting the rest of it. No call, no email, nothing. I called and texted and not one of my contact points was ever returned. At this point it was late December and we thought maybe he and his crew had holiday plans but would resume right after. Then another windstorm hit and his crew had embraced the partially completed structure correctly and it almost collapsed again. I tried for two weeks to find him. I even drove out to the address on the contract we signed, which ended up being a house on a rural road next town over. I knocked on the door, seeing his car there. No one answered. I stopped by his house several different times trying to catch him. The last few times his car was no longer there, but the work truck of another company was. Wanting to know if he owned the house, I pulled up tax records for it in the county it was in. Name of the house was registered to him, so sounds like he rented or at least was staying with a friend. The company info on the truck was registered to someone unrelated and not on the tax records. The tax records showed that the actual taxpayer of the property lived elsewhere. Here where I live, the property owner name is listed and if they do not actually live at that property, such as in using it for an investment, their address that would have the actual tax bill sent to is also on there. Given that knowledge, I pulled the court records for him to see if maybe he had been recently arrested or if there was any other info. What I found was about 30 years of driving offenses, including a lot of DUI slash DWI charges and other records. At this point, I figured he was long gone and being as I hadn't paid out any money to him for work that was not complete, I would just move on. At least until the structural engineer I hired to assess the damage to the work that was done stated that the structure had to be started over on that part and the building materials that the contractor had left scattered around the job site were also unusable due to being left improperly stored. I had hoped that the structure could just be pulled back into place and resecured, but I was told this is not the case. So began the bigger drama and my determination to find him. So far his negligence has cost $1,200 for a structural engineer opinion. Our insurance company paid for a second opinion because they didn't like what ours said. $2,500 for insurance deductible to the newest contractor hired to repair the exact damage that happened three months prior and $7,000 in materials that his insurance company refused to cover or pay for and my insurance policy on the project did not cover either. The adjuster for his insurance company said that he was able to locate the contractor but refused to give up any information for him directly. That and the fact that the project wasn't finished had detriment to my farm and boarding business because two of my pastures that were connected to where the building was sitting couldn't be used. This limited my ability to use natural pasture grass in summer months by rotating pastures for each herd and had to purchase hay, which gets quite expensive. By the time the building was completed and I could get my pastures back to normal, I had losses of over $14,000. Because I didn't know where he now lived, I used the only address I had for him to file for small claims court, which here has a limit of $15,000. The court documents I served came back undeliverable. This meant that I was kind of stuck because a court date cannot be scheduled until all parties are properly served. But how do I find an address for someone who doesn't seem to register any particular address directly? Time was still on my side, as this was still early mid last year. So I kept a watch on social media for anything with his name, which was a very unique one. If there was another man of the same name within this state, within even the same metro area, it was unlikely because of how unique the name was. Then one day this past fall, after Google searching the name again, there it was, his Facebook page. His name hadn't shown up before on Facebook with several searches. Not sure why this was the case. Even better, all his settings were set to public. I could see everything he wrote about, including his recent commitment to stay sober earlier in 2017, just after he abandoned my project, and his employer's name. He had posted a pic of him on a job site and someone asked where he worked now. He named the place, so a quick Google search and voila, got an address to serve him court papers to. So I refiled with the newfound address, but I still needed a home address to enforce the judgment once I won the case. So what did I do? Seeing that he was listed as single in his page, I used a fake FB profile that I originally had in use to test various features I enable on pages that I start up under my real profile. 
Truthfully, I only use that profile for that purpose, to make sure the settings I put in place truly work. But now it would serve another purpose. Getting this guy to give me all the information I needed, playing on his being middle-aged and single. To create my alter ego, I found a website of a cute blonde lady in her 40s, so as to not be too young for him, since he was around mid-40s himself, and just yanked pics. I only set one to the profile photo, and we use the rest if he asked for more. I changed all the pics in the profile to look like it was a typical page of the average mid-40s female. Holy crap did this work, and it worked so well. I used some information I found on his page to strike up a conversation about stuff stolen out of his work truck in the alley behind his house. Big clue. And it was reported to the city police department. He named the city, so another big clue. So using this information, and telling him I had grown up in the same area, I got him to give me a general area where he lived. Keeping conversation cool, like, is the pizza joint still there? They've been around forever, etc., so he wouldn't get suspicious. Thank goodness for Google Maps giving me a better idea of that area, so I could talk about it like I did in fact grow up there. In reality, I've only ever been in that city twice, and other times drove through on the way to somewhere else. I was able to narrow down the area he talked about, and using that info I pulled the police report records from that city. There were three reports done within the same area, on that same day he reported. So using that information, I pulled the county tax records to see who owned the houses. I found three houses within that area that could possibly be rentals, since the owner name and taxpayer billing address did not match. This could be a long shot to find the person, but I didn't have anything to lose by searching. Just as I was about to call the homeowners to see if anyone by the name of the contractor rented from them, he posted some info on his page that made the calls completely unnecessary. He posted the name of his roommate in a status update, who I then check out the profile of. The profile lists the roommate's landscaping business. A quick Google search of that business name and bingo! His state business registration address matched one of the three addresses I suspected to be the rental house. So now I have his home address. He had already been served at his employer's address for the court date. Fast forward to the court date. He didn't show up, which I suspected he wouldn't, so I got default judgment. Between serving him papers and the court date passing, the FB profile I was using to talk to him was helpful in getting info out of him about his life, his job situation, how much he made per hour, me feigning knowledge about what construction trades paid. And the fact that he was looking at changing employers. He even told me the name of that employer. So I was armed with info, should he decide to not work with me. He played right into my hands. Once I got the official judgment from the small claims court win, I decided to contact him myself on Facebook using Messenger. I sat down and wrote out a whole paragraph to him, first typing it in words so that I could print it out and edit it, and have my husband read it as well. I wrote that while I was angry at him. I was going to give him one chance to work a deal with me, rather than using our State Department of Revenue play collection officer for me. I hate dealing with our State Department of Revenue. They make the IRS look like Sunday school teachers. But if it came down to that, I would, and they would start garnishing his wages. And here they take 25% of each paycheck after taxes, and have the person's employer do it for them, and then send it to me. However, I hate letting the state be the middleman because they just complicate things. But I told him straight out that if he refused to work with me directly, I would go to that extreme. I told him that I know he's an addict, and has had struggles in the past. I told him that knowing he has struggles, I was willing to work with him directly and give him an opportunity to offer a monthly payment amount that works for him and his budget, rather than have the state decide the amount for him. To shorten this up, he replied, agreed, signed and had notarized a monthly payment agreement, complete with a list of manual labor tasks that he could use in place of a payment or two to help with some projects on my farm. The second story is, full-time employment to part-time hours, no problem. This wasn't me, but it was glorious. This is my high school best friend who I've spent countless hours playing Tetris with. It was like his motto anytime I had a problem he seemed to solve it, using basic Tetris skills. In truth, this guy not only can organize, he can optimize. When is this ever a bad skill set? He went to college. I joined the Navy three years later. Both didn't work out for either of us. We moved in with each other and got as many jobs as we could work. I had two, he had three, and we helped each other get these jobs. I finally landed full-time work at the local college, but kept a weekend job. When another full-time job opened up, I was in a position to vouch for him and he got it. A warehouse delivery driver. His only job was to pull orders from the stock and deliver to the building a room that needed it. He started doing things like taking inventory and reorganizing the warehouse. Simple things like alphabetizing the books, putting the toner cartridges in numerical order, and other common sense optimizations. I didn't work in that department, but I did deal with it quite a bit. When he was hired, there were three drivers. After six months, he was the only one left. They didn't replace the other guys who quit, because they were also students, and they moved on. He had no problem handling the whole campus. His supervisor loved him, by the way, but he's not the one with the purse. Then came some cutbacks. I was all that was left in my department, and his hours got cut in half. No problem for him, he just worked more at his night job by going in earlier. Then people weren't getting their deliveries. They asked him to work longer hours, but not full time and not on a schedule. 
They really only want him to work longer on days that people complained. He declined, as basic organization needs a schedule. About three months into this bad situation, he had resolved it to get each department a weekly instead of on-call delivery and everyone was happy. Also, his supervisor was retiring. My buddy applied, of course. He felt the interview went well, but when time came, they hired an outside applicant. His supervisor in his last two weeks was supposed to train the new guy. His training was probably really good on ordering and supplies, but nothing on the rest of the operation. My buddy turned into an instant idiot. Where do you want me to stock these? And basic stuff like he was a new hire too. Anytime the new boss said you should know, my buddy just kept saying the old supervisor ran a tight ship and never allowed outside the box thinking. Fast forward a month and the new supervisor found out there used to be three full-time drivers. So he seeks permission to hire a new one. Mind you, no departments were complaining about deliveries. He gets approved for one and hires a full-time guy. But left my buddy on part-time. My buddy goes around and tells all departments they'll have daily on-call deliveries again. They're happy. Then he shows the new hire the route, the stock sequence, and goes with him during his half days for two weeks. Then my buddy quits. He actually had another job lined up, but he'd been planning this for a while. I was still there, and man did SH hit the fan. My department came to a halt, as we didn't get a warehouse delivery for six weeks. My buddy used to report low stock on items to the old supervisor, but he stopped when the new guy came. He told me paper products were practically clockwork. White was delivered everywhere, but the color papers were different to each place and in different quantity. He figured out the ratios and stored them by department use, rather than all copy paper here, all goldenrod here, etc. He said he did that with all kinds of supplies that were common across departments. Also, the manager didn't even order color paper as the boxes of copy paper faced out and didn't order copy because it looked like they had so much. By the time my department got a delivery, they were back up to three drivers. At one point, the head pencil pusher asked if I could get my buddy to come back once he found out I recommended him. I said he got a full-time job. He didn't quit because he hated it here. Thank you for watching the video to the end. Have a good day.